Well, hey, if we've never met before or this is your first time here, I'm Chris. I'm the associate pastor. Uh, glad to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, let me ask you a question. Anybody here love football? Wow, this is like a third of the room. Y'all are even wor- This is worse than the last hour. I will pray for all of you. Football, you're, you're Texans. How do you not love football? But y'all, did, y'all didn't know that college football kickoff was this past weekend, right? Yeah. It was, it was three, three games. None of them were really important. I, I think the only thing that happened was Notre Dame beat the snot out of Navy. Uh, but I love football. I played football all throughout my entire time in school from elementary all the way through high school. And one of the memories I will never forget is my first year on varsity, the very first game on the second play, I got injured. I had a defensive lineman that landed on my leg and he ended up rolling my ankle and I ended up with a grade three sprain on my foot and I couldn't walk. And so I ended up having to go out of the game and just sit on the sidelines for the the remainder of those four quarters. And I remember that next week I went to practice, I walked up to the trainer and I was like, hey, what are we going to do about this? And she's like, look, you're not going to play this week. Like there is, there is no way this is going to happen. And I'll be honest with you, there was a part of me that was a little excited about that sit on the sidelines, watch all my friends do all the work and all the running, and I get to drink all the Gatorade, win-win. But something just didn't feel right. I'd been playing football for five years at that point, and I had barely ever missed a single snap of football. And so missing a whole game just didn't feel right. I felt like I belonged on that field. I belonged in that game. And so I was willing to do whatever it took to make that happen. And so I went through all the therapy steps I had to do for my foot. I iced it for 40 minutes every single day. I did all my little agilities and things like that I had to do. And on game day, I was still in pain, but I went up to my coach, did a little tap dance routine to show him that I was okay to play. And then I went straight to my trainer and I said, Brittany, tape this ankle until it doesn't move. And that's what she did. She wrapped it as tight as she could. And I went and I played every single snap of that football game. Now, we won the game. It was a great time. I was all excited. I went home and I was in the worst pain I had been in all week. But I'll be honest with you, it was worth it. The easy thing for me to do would have been absolutely just to go to the game and watch. I could have sat on that sidelines and watched my team play, but I didn't want to just watch the game. I belonged in the game. So I made the choice to step out onto the field. Well, we're continuing our sermon series, The Church Is, this week. And what we've been doing is taking the past few weeks to look at what the church is really all about. And so we've talked about the past couple of weeks how the church is the family and the church is the bride. And this week, we're talking about how the church is the body. And what we're going to be talking about today is serving and its fulfillment and impact it has in our lives. And so all throughout the sermon, you'll notice at the top of the screen up here, we're going to have the church number and the text served to that number. At any point during the sermon today, if you feel led, you can text serve to this number to sign up to serve for our different teams. This may be the only time you ever hear a pastor tell you this, but I would love it if you would text in the middle of my message. And so at any point you feel like you're led to do that, pull out your phone. I promise you I won't make fun of you very much. But last week, Nathan talked about holiness, and one of the big concepts he had is that holiness isn't really an option for us that we're slaves to God, we're called to be slaves because we belong to God. And so when we talk about devotion to Jesus, you can't really be half in, right? It's all in or nothing. And one of the areas that the church tends to struggle the most with this idea of being all in is the area of serving. Anybody here that's ever played a sport knows that people love the idea of being on the team. People want the jersey, they want the uniform, everyone loves the camaraderie and the victory and the celebrations, that's all awesome. But when it comes time to work, to be on the team, they don't want to commit. And I think that same thing's true in Christianity. I think we love the idea of being on Team Jesus, right? We love Team Jesus. We like wearing the shirts. We'll come hang out for an hour. We'll sing the songs. But when it comes time to step onto the field, so many of us choose to sit on the sidelines with our faith. But this isn't what you're made for. This isn't what you're called to. Jesus has called you to have an active faith and to be a big part in the kingdom of God. And so that's our focus this morning, is that Christianity isn't a spectator sport. You belong in the game. And I believe that if you can grasp that concept and step onto the field, it'll change everything for you. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew 25. That's where we'll be this morning. And we're going to be looking at the parable of the talents here in a second. But before we dive into scripture, I want to give you just a little bit of context of what's happening around this passage. Now, we're towards the end of the book of Matthew. And by this point, we're also nearing the end of Jesus' ministry. 
Jesus knew that in just two days at this point, in two days, he would be betrayed by Judas, arrested, and eventually executed on the cross. And so at this point, as he sits on the Mount of Olives with his disciples, he's basically telling them about what's to happen and how they should prepare for it. And so in chapter 25, what he's doing is he is telling the disciples about his eventual return after his resurrection. And we often call this the second coming of Jesus. And so Jesus is telling them how they should prepare for that. And in the chapter before this, he told them, he said, look, you will not know when I return, but you need to be ready for it. And then he spends this chapter showing them different parables about heaven, teaching them about the importance and the urgency of the mission that Jesus has called his church to. And so that's what we're going to pick up in the story today. This is Matthew 25, verse 14. It says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So as Jesus is teaching about heaven, he introduces this man who's about to leave on a journey. And what he does before he leaves is he takes all of his wealth and he divides it among his servants for them to use and to grow his money while he's gone. And if you hear this and don't know the context of what's happening, it's really easy to think that um, this is kind of an unwise decision, right? I mean, why would you give all of your money to the lowly servant here, right? But in the context of Jesus' time, if you understand the customs, this was not only a common practice, this was actually a really wise choice because servants during that time period in Jesus' time were often given great responsibilities and great roles throughout their time. And so for him to do this, to give his wealth to his servants, would have been a safe and smart choice for him to do this. Because for these servants, their very purpose of existence at this point is to fulfill the tasks graciously given to them by the master. And so this was to be their very lives until they returned. And Jesus, what he's doing here is he's drawing a parallel for his disciples. Because just like the master who would leave for his journey and entrust all of his wealth to his servants, Jesus was leaving to go to heaven after his death and resurrection, and he was entrusting his church with the disciples. And so as Jesus was the light of the world, they were to be the light on the hill. As Jesus was the good shepherd, they would take care of his sheep. As Jesus made disciples, they too would make disciples. And this is the same calling that we have as the church today. We are still carrying out this responsibility. And so if you're a follower of Christ, you are a servant of God, and your very purpose and call in your life is to take care of and advance God's church. You get to play a big part in that. And so as we do this, it's really easy to think sometimes that we don't belong in the game. But when you look at passages like this, one of the things I think we so often do is we tend to look at this and go, well, this is obviously talking about church leaders, right? I mean, this is, this is talking to pastors and elders and your board of directors and all that. This doesn't apply to me. But that's not true. Uh, will you go to verse 14 for me? Thank you. That word servants right there is actually the same Greek word that we talked about last week, and that word is doulos. And this word in the New Testament, when it's not used to describe individuals, it's used in contexts like this to describe the collective group of followers of Christ. And so this is who we are as followers of Jesus. As Christians, we are the douloi. We are the servants of God, and we are called to take care of God's church and God's people. And Jesus reinforces this idea with his disciples in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So for Jesus... He's telling them the point that he's making here is that this is going to be your life. When Jesus tells them to go and make disciples, that's not really a great translation because that word go is actually a participle, and it's best translated as as you are going. And so the point that Jesus is making to them and to us is this is who you are. This is what you're going to do for the remainder of your life, that you are called to have a deep devotion to God and his kingdom. And so, yes, we make disciples, but we also teach people to lead, or we lead people to be obedient to Jesus and his teachings. And a big part of that teaching is that we were to serve. And so if we're really going to be the church that Jesus has called us to be, we have to stop waiting on his return and we have to start preparing for it. See, the reality for us is that you can't be a servant of God without serving his people. 
that this is the task entrusted by us to the master. Jesus has given us the great responsibility of taking care of his church and taking care of his people. And this is something that we need to step up to the call. You know, our church has grown in a lot of ways over the past two years. And I think that we are an incredibly loving group of people and we're a very generous church. But one of the ways that I would love to see us continue to grow is that I would love to see that everybody here is involved in serving in some capacity. And so there's plenty of ways you guys can get involved here, and, and we'll talk more about that later. But here's the deal. Don't just go to church. Be the church. Step up into the game. Step onto the field because you belong in the game and start serving God's people. Let's look at our next verse. This is Matthew 15, or 25, 15. It says, to one he gave five bags of gold and to the other two bags and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. So Jesus is giving some different amounts to the servants here. And so what we see is you have one servant who gets five bags of gold, one servant that gets two bags of gold, and then you got this last servant, right? He gets one bag of gold. And when you first look at something like this, it's easy to go, Man, that, that last servant, he must not be very trustworthy. Like he gets one little measly bag of gold, the other one gets five. I mean, that other dude at least got two. But when we're talking about this, you need to understand something about these bags of gold. Okay, that's not the best translation ever. The word in the Greek is the word talenta, and it's where we get our word talents. And so NIV translates it bags of gold, but a talenta or talent in Jesus' time is actually a unit of weight. And these units of weight actually typically measured somewhere around 20 years worth of a day's wages. And so if you were to put that in perspective of U.S., so let's just take the, the average median income of the U.S. individual today. This would be the equivalent of someone, if they gave you one talent, someone handing you somewhere between $900,000 and $1.2 million. So these are not small sums of money. And so I love this concept because Jesus is showing here that even the smallest of roles in the kingdom have the greatest importance to him. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 24. He says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. With all our presentable parts need no special treatment. God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. And so the idea here is that everyone has a place serving in the kingdom of God. Nobody has to sit on the sidelines because all of us have ways that we can make an impact. And so no matter what way you serve, every single role has vital importance to the kingdom of God. And I love the way that Paul talks about this. He says, look, the things that seem indispensable, right, the things that you think would be the weak ones are the ones that you should keep the most. And I love this because it's a reminder to me that you don't have to serve on the worship team to be important in the kingdom of God. You don't have to lead a community group or be an elder or serve on the board of directors to make a difference. Every role that you can find is a way to improve and impact the kingdom of God. What you do here matters. The one talent was just as important to the master as the five. And so if we're serving, even if that means for you jumping into some small role, that role matters more than you can possibly imagine. So I would encourage you to do that. Now, on the other side of this, if you have great gifts and great talents, you have a calling and a responsibility to use them for the kingdom of God. The master, Jesus says, gives five talents to one of the servants. And this is not because this servant is like his favorite servant. This isn't his buddy. Jesus says it's because he's more capable. And in the same way for us, some of you have gifts and talents that other people do not have. You have more capabilities and you're called and trusted to use that for the kingdom of God. Some of you are great leaders. Some of you have awesome music ability that other people don't have. Some of you are great with people. Some of you are great with kids. Some of you are good with technology. Some of you just have this weird, uncanny ability to connect with people. And I could list a million different ways you guys could have gifts and talents, but the point here is that if you have these gifts and you have these talents, you should be using them for the kingdom of God because this is what you're called to. And so this is my challenge to you is don't waste your talents. If you don't know what you're gifted in, I would encourage you to get involved and serve in any capacity you possibly can. Find a role, get involved with it. But if you know that you have gifts and talents that can be used for the church, I would challenge you to take the next step in serving and to actually be a part of those teams. 
See, it makes a great impact in the kingdom of God when we serve in the ways that God has created us to. So use your talents, serve God, and step onto the field because it makes a difference. Let's look at our next verses. These are verses 16 and 18. It says, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. And so also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So we're starting to get this picture of what happens with these servants, right? And you, and you start to see this drastically different picture between the first two servants and the third. So these first two servants, man, they are incredibly faithful. They take this money, they start putting it to work, and Jesus says they earned double what they started with. That's awesome. But then you got the third servant. This dude doesn't try and invest anything. He doesn't try and put the money to work. All he does is find a hole, dig it, bury the money. Done. And when you think about what Jesus is talking about here, remember the context of his parable is that the master would return. And so the whole point that Jesus is asking them is, what would you do to prepare for that? And I have to imagine that the third servant at this point feels pretty good about himself because I imagine the thoughts in his mind are, bury it in the field, check on it every once in a while. You know, look, when the master comes back, I'll dig it up. I'll present it to him. I've lost no money, no work, no worry. Everything's good. Win-win. But that's not really what happens. We're going to see the different ways that the master responds to the servants here in just a second. Look at uh, verse 19 with me. It says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. And master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. And see, I have gained five more. And his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, and I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man with two bags also came, and he said, Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold, and see, I've gained two more. And his master replied again, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So the master returns, and he starts to settle the accounts with the servants, and the very first ones that he interacts with are these first two servants. And he finds exactly what he hoped he would. These servants, they were faithful, they took the money, they started investing it and doing all these things, and the master is pleased with the results of their work. And so there's two principles that we can learn from the interaction with these first two servants. And the first one is, is that the work of God's kingdom never returns void. Jesus' examples here showcase a consistency with the servants who are faithful. If you didn't catch on on this, they had the exact same outcome. It wasn't the same amount, but for both of these servants, they received double the investment they had originally. And the principle that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples here is a reminder that when you serve in God's kingdom, there's always good that comes from it. Yeah, I love hearing stories like Tina's last week because it's a reminder that something as simple as opening the door for someone with a smile on your face makes a monumental impact in people's lives. I mean, I know sometimes it's hard to think about it like this, but the way you serve in God's kingdom actually helps to change people's lives. It helps to grow the church, that you get to play a big part in that. See, when we're faithful when the, with the responsibilities that Jesus has given us, He's faithful to bless our efforts. And we've seen him do that here at Kara City all the time. We've been watching as people come to follow Jesus. We're watching as people get baptized and as more and more people come to church. God is being faithful to bless as we've done this. And it's amazing to see the ways that God's working. And a big part of that has to do with the fact that we're faithful to the responsibilities he's given us. And God will bless and honor that. But serving isn't just about that it impacts the kingdom. Serving also helps to grow us, and that's our second principle. So look back with me at verse 21 real quick. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, the master replies with the same response to both servants, and these verses are not there to say, ah, oh, well, if you do what Jesus told you to do, you'll be rich. The point of these is to showcase the, exam the servant's growth, that as the servants were faithful to their responsibilities of the master, you see that they grow in their capabilities and their responsibilities. And the same thing's true for us, that when we're faithful in serving God and serving his church, we grow in our faith and our responsibilities. And so what you'll watch happen often on a practical level is that you'll watch as this capacity to serve eventually grows into a capacity to lead. And so eventually you're able to help lead others to serve in the same way that you serve faithfully. But serving also works to greatly increase our joy. If you look at the end of these verses, it says, come and share your master's 
happiness. And that word happiness is not as good of a translation for this as some others. And the word in the Greek here is kara. And this word is best translated literally as joy. And it comes from the same root as the word charis, or as we say in Texas, charis, which is where we get the word grace. And so it's not a coincidence that these are related because the word literally means a joy that comes from the awareness of God's grace and favor. And so the point here is that this is a joy that brings us into deep relationship with God. It's a joy that brings us into relationship with his people, and it helps us to find fulfillment and contentment as we live out the purpose that Jesus has called us to. And this isn't just a biblical principle. In 2020, during COVID, the American Journal of Preventative Medicine was trying to figure out some ways that they could help to improve the longevity and quality of life for people over the age of 50. And in their research, they found that of all the different ways that you could do this, the most impactful was serving people. That anybody over this age that regularly served people improved in their quality of life through uh, physical health, they were less lonely, they were less likely to be depressed, they had higher rates of optimism, and they had a newfound sense of purpose in their life. And this doesn't just apply to people over the age of 50. In 2011, a similar study was done by the American Psychological Association, and they found the exact same thing for people of all ages, that people who regularly served grew in different areas of well-being in their life, that they were happier, they were more content, they were confident, they had felt like they had a little more control of the direction of their life, and they were less depressed and in better health. And so these studies point to the same thing that Jesus is trying to say here, is that serving brings the joy of the Lord into our life. It brings us into close relationship with God. It helps us to deepen and grow with our community. And it leads us to fulfillment as we carry out the purpose and calling that Jesus has placed on our life. Serving is worth it. So get in the game. Let's look at our next verses. We're about to transition over to the third servant. It said that the man who had received one bag of gold came and said, Master, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. So we have this great interaction with the first two servants and the master. And, and then you get the third servant. And his presentation is lackluster, to say the least. He digs up his talent, he brings it to the master, and immediately he just shoots excuses, right? He says, look, I, I, I just, I was, a, I was afraid of you, and I just, I knew that you're the kind of guy who's pretty successful in whatever he does, and so, so I, just, I just didn't think I really had anything to bring to it, so here's, here's the one. And the servant wasn't really afraid of the master. He was just deeply convinced that he didn't have to do anything, because the servant, or the master was already so successful, and Man, the other servants, look what they were doing, right? They were doing amazing work. And so he looked at that and said, well, the master already earns his own money. The servants are doing a great job. What, what do I need to do? I'm just going to bury it and wait. And I think so often we find ourselves in the same place as this third servant, whether we realize it or not. I think the reality for us is that you know you're called to serve. I think we're really good at coming up with excuses as to why we can't. You know, and maybe your excuses are similar to the third servants, right? It's like, I mean, other people just do a great job already. And I'm, just, I'm not really that talented of a guy. So, like, I, I'm just not going to do that. And honestly, you know, I just, the kids, I mean, the kids are so busy and, and work's just got me swamped and I'm just tired. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to serve right now, but I'll wait until there's a better time for me to do it when I feel better and I feel like it's right. But honestly, man, even if I had the time to serve, you know, what would I even get out of it? And really, what kind of difference would I make? I mean, and, and what team would I even serve on? So you, you know what? I'm just not going to do it. It's easier if I just don't, right? And I think what we do so often is that we convince ourselves that serving is an option when it's not. Serving is the calling place in our lives, but what we've done is we have convinced ourselves that we need to weigh the convenience of serving all while neglecting the responsibility of serving. So the reality is that this is the purpose that we're called to, that serving isn't something we do when our schedule frees up. It's the part of our lives that we're called to, that this is what we are created for. We created for the purpose of glorifying God and serving his people. 
And this is what we learn in Ephesians 2.10. It says that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance. That this is who we are, that Christianity is not a spectator sport. You belong in the game. You're created for good works. You're created to serve God and serve his people. And you can't really live the life that God has designed for you by sitting on the sidelines. And Jesus solidifies this idea in our last verses, starting in verse 26. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I'll harvest where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever who has will be given more and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they do have will be taken away from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus' point to the end of his parable is not that if we just skip out on serving, we go to hell. The point that he's making here is that when we choose to neglect the importance of serving and the part that we play in that, we have missed the very heart of God for his people in his church. So you can't be a servant of God without serving his people. The grace and the love and truth of Jesus will always lead you to serve God because this is the calling that he's placed on your life. It is the responsibility given to us by the master. So let me ask you this morning. Are you carrying out your responsibilities? Are you playing the game on the field or are you sitting on the sidelines? Are you living out the calling and the very purpose that God has placed in your life? Or are you like the wicked servant, wasting what God has given you by not using it? And as you think about your answer, here's the challenge I wanna give you this morning. Get in the game. Don't be a spectator with God and his church. Be a part of this. Step onto the field and get into the game. This is important for us. This is who we are. It's what we're created to do is to serve God and serve his people. And so if you're here and you're not involved in serving in any capacity, I'm just gonna tell you, this is the day. I'm telling you right now, this is the moment to step up and step on the field to get involved in God's kingdom because it's what you're called to. And look, we're trying to make that as easy for you guys as we can. I'm gonna pull something in my back pocket real quick. It's, uh, it's not a little note card. Uh, what this is, is a little serving card. And at the table, Adam talked to you guys a little bit earlier about the community group booth right out here. But that table also has these cards on it. And what they are is they have every team listed that we have for you guys to serve on. It's more than you think it would be. And what you can do is fill out this card Give us a little bit of information. Let us know what teams you're interested in serving with or getting more information about. And you can just drop that in the box like you do with offerings and connect cards. But you guys can also text that number I told you. It's been up here this whole time. If you text that number, it'll take you to a link that says the exact same thing. It'll give you all of our different ways to serve and you can sign up there. But don't just be on the sidelines. Be a part of this. And if you're here and you're already serving in Care City, I wanna give you a challenge. I wanna challenge and encourage you to take the next step in serving. And so for you, maybe that looks like serving more than once a month, or maybe it looks like you've been a regular volunteer for a little while, and maybe you're feeling called to step up and be a leader and help lead other volunteers. I would encourage you to do that. Or maybe you've been serving on a team, but you know that you've got gifts and talents that you're not using for the church. I would encourage you step up, serve on those teams and be a part of that. But however you need to respond, Don't be a spectator. Christianity isn't a spectator sport. We belong in the game. This is what we're created for. This is your very purpose. Serving helps to grow you. It grows the kingdom of God. It makes an impact in your life and the lives around you. Some of you may uh, know by now, if, if you're new, that's okay. You won't know this about me, but I love to play guitar. And when I first started figuring out where I wanted to serve in the church, I knew that I loved Jesus and I knew that I loved guitar. And so naturally serving in church on a worship band was something that was kind of a no-brainer for me. And so I've been doing that for about eight years and I take every opportunity I can to play in a worship band if I have the ability. And nowadays you guys don't really get to see that as much because I have a different role on Sunday mornings and so there's different responsibilities and things that come with that but usually a few Sundays out of the year you'll still catch me up here playing with the band and 
it's one of the greatest feelings in the world when I get to do that. And it, I'll be honest with you, it has nothing to do with being up on the stage because you guys don't know this about me, but when I get up there and I play guitar, I actually get really nervous to play in front of you guys. And I know that seems weird given I can get up here and preach in front of you with no problem, but I do. I get a little stage fright. It's okay. And so being up on the stage isn't what I love about this. But what I love is that it's the greatest feeling because I know that I'm doing what I'm called to do. That when I get up there and I get to play with that band, I am using my talents, my gifts for the kingdom of God. I am fulfilling the purpose that is called on my life because this is who I am. It's who I'm called to be, that I am a servant of God and I am called to use my gifts for his kingdom. Same thing's true for you. You were created to serve God and serve his people. Christianity isn't a spectator sport. You belong in the game. And if you'll choose to take part in that calling and step out onto the field, it will change you and we will change this city together as a church. So will you do it? Will you step onto the field or will you sit on the sidelines? Let's pray.